And I'm just going to look at three different <coughs> verses here. Talking about what Daniel saw. And you can also go to um, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, and read some more about the onset of the, what who we would understand as Antichrist. Um, James chapter 7, verse 8. Now, Daniel seen a vision of the four great beasts and so forth, and then the little horns come up. We're not going to get into all that. I, I just want to talk, we're just going to look at the um, presentation of, of uh, when the Antichrist is going to come here. And Daniel said, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes, were eyes like the eyes of man, and the mouth speaking great things. Then look at verse 20 in that same chapter. And the ten horns that were in the head of the other came forth, uh, came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And look down at verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change, now listen to this, think to change the times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Um, <coughs> <laughs> and I'm not, again, I'm not going to preach a, a message on Antichrist himself here, uh, but one of the great when I was uh, learned years ago when I was studying Revelation and did some history that before the Protestant Reformation came along, the most accepted idea about Antichrist was he was the Catholic Pope. <laughs> Everybody, back now I'm talking 500, 600, 700 years ago. Um, St. Bernard in the 12th century called Pope and Anacletus the Antichrist. In the 13th century, Frederick II, ruler of the Roman Empire, accused Pope Gregory of being the Antichrist. But it wasn't only Catholics calling Catholics Antichrist. Some of the most responsible Protestant scholars um, uh, were convinced that Antichrist was living in Rome disguised as the Pope. <laughs> The list of, is impressive. Martin Luther, leader of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin, the French reformer, Huldrych Zwingli, a Swiss reformer. Of course, we've heard of all her, you know, William Tyndale, English reformer, all of those uh, believe that um, pointing the finger towards, towards the Pope. Now, it, it would easy, be easy to do that, but I don't think the Pope's the Antichrist. I don't think he is, and nor will he be. Um, but it's interesting that... Um, People have been looking for years as to who the Antichrist is, and you know the the bottom line is we don't know who the Antichrist is going to be. I believe this. I believe he's in the world today. I I believe he's walking around somewhere. It hasn't been exposed. He might even still be a child, but uh, he's going to be born. He's not going to come supernaturally. He, he's going to be born. He's going to be raised, and um, but when he does come on the scene, he will have a great oratory. He, he'll be able to speak well. He will have an un, unnatural, um, supernatural charisma. He'll be somebody people will follow. People will be so moved by what he has to say uh, that the masses of the population of the earth will follow after him. Um, verse 21 states that his appearance was greater than his fellows, you know, the, all the others that he's talking about, the ten horns and, the, and all the kingdoms and those who came out. Um, I believe this, this will be a man that is extremely attractive. I believe um, he will be extremely seductive. Daniel, in, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, states that he will seize power by, one translation says, intrigue, but the King James says, by flattery, he'll, he'll, just, he'll just smooth you. He'll just wing you over by smoothing you. But he will be a cultic leader. He will speak against the Most High God. He will even attempt to, now listen, he will even attempt to change the moral and natural laws of the universe. Now how, how do you say, well, how can you possibly do that? Or even get away with thinking that, well, just hang on for a minute. 
It's like in anything else. When, when the devil tries to do something, and when he's starting to get away with it, there, there's one or two things you're going to see almost immediately. That God is going to be taken out of the picture the best that he can do it. Um, think back in the early 60s and the middle 60s when God was taken out of prayer, out of the schools, and, and when God's been taken out, out of most curriculum. Um, mine and Jesse was my fifth grade teacher. When I was in fifth grade, we still had prayer. And this is a public school. She would read scripture and have prayer. That, that quit, I think, the next year, when I was like 66 or 67. Um, that that, that kind of went came to an end. But people still did that back then. But when the devil starts taking control and, and we allow, the first thing you're going to see is that God's name is going to be stricken. God's uh, presence is going to be removed. They're going to try to get your eyes off anything scriptural, off anything biblical, off anything that even sounds like it's something um, supernatural in the sense of a, of a divine deity. And we, we certainly have seen that now. And you wonder, well, how in the world can, can anybody come on the scene um, that uh, would even attempt to do this? I want to say something right up front. When the church is weak, when, when the church is weak, then sin abounds. When the church is weak, then sin becomes um, stronger in the public arena. Uh, there's always going to be sin, and, and the, the public arena is always going to be sinful. We understand that. But when, when the church was powerful, when the local church was respected, when, when the local church stood up um, and fought the battle like they should, instead of just being all inclusive to everybody, there made a difference in the moral standard and the moral fiber of our, not only our country, but of the world. And everywhere you see where that's been challenged and God's starting to, then that's what you get. We're getting what we're getting today. And we're, we're seeing what we're seeing. And we're, we're all wondering, uh, you know, uh, how can all this be coming about? How can all this be happening? Um, how can we let it, how can we let it happen? I, I mentioned in Sunday school that Vance Howard, one of the great preachers of days gone by, he's dead and gone now, but he said probably 50 or 60 years ago, he said so many churches live so below standard, you would have to backslide to have fellowship with them. He said that the average Christian is so subnormal when, we, when it comes to scriptural standards of living, when one is so uh, subnormal, when one becomes normal and tries to live for the Lord, uh, most modern Christians uh, think that they are subnormal because they're, they're living in their tallest goody two shoes or this or that. The church is so inundated with subnormalcy when it comes to scriptural standard of living that we're, we're seeing what happens when the church is weak. So we have to wonder about ourselves. How in the world can any of this really take place? Why? Uh, <laughs> You, you have to wonder, how would the world let anybody achieve such power, political power, in, in the political systems of the world? You know, we started reading, you think about you know, Adolf Hitler in the Second World War, how, Israel, uh, how um, Germany had lost the First World War and their economic strain was so tight. Uh, they said people would, would literally put, uh, could, could um, fill up a wheelbarrow with German marks and take it to somebody to, just to buy a, a loaf of bread. That's how the economy was so uh, diluted and busted. And when Hitler came along, uh, he promised uh, that the chaos would end and he, he could bring bread back to every plate and he, he would help um, uh, Germany be great again and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the eroding conditions in Germany helped the German people to believe what Hitler was saying and he could uh, then do, uh, then he would have a better way of life, and then, of course, Nazism took over and so forth. And I went to, I've been to Germany, maybe some of you have, but I went to those areas where, Germany, where Hitler had those Nazi congresses and things. It's, of course, now there's, there's four-way interstates going through, and, and there's soccer stadiums. And, I mean, all the places where he had those great German congresses, those Nazi congresses, it, it, now there's... It's just so wide and massive. There's just hundreds of people that live in that area now, which used to be just for one, <coughs> one gathering every now and then. Because he did everything so big and said it so often that people began to believe it. He was changing the very culture 
of not only it, but mankind came to how man would be because of they thought necessity. And so we think, how in the world could this ever happen to such a scale as the Bible talks about? Well, I want to remind us that just not a few years ago, a certain president, President Fikandi, came along, and, was, and he is not the Antichrist, by the way, but um, he was so influential in his speech, and the people were so hungry for what he had to hear, what he had to say, that the Nobel Peace Prize was given to him literally for what he might do. I remember hearing the speech that was given. And when they came out, and of course Barack Obama, but they, and I, I sat there and I was so dumbfounded that they said, you know, this guy, he's coming along, he's saying the right things. Of course, his, his background, uh, being an African American and so forth, uh, and for our country, but he was the light of the world for many people. He was saying so many things, and people flocked to him, and people um, who would normally not even be involved in any of that flocked to him and listened to what he had to say to the point that one of the most prestigious awards in the world would give him something for what he might do hmm. because they wanted him to continue on the path he was on and they wanted him to continue on the, you know, the way he was going because it was so diametrically opposed to what, the, what America had stood for. And even though the world loves to take our money and loves our help, they hate what we stand for, hmm. what America has stood for. Now, I'm not preaching on America, but I want you to understand, do you know at this very moment in time, I was reading even yesterday, where even a lot of evangelicals, Christians, are saying that it's not right to be um, patriotic about America. That, that if you're a Christian, you have no right to be a patriot because of, of, the, uh, of the things that uh, America has done, the racism and all that. Well, you know what? Every nation has, has suffered along those lines, but there's no nation in the history of the planet that's ever helped and stood up and, and, and had the back of those who were bereaved and those who were downtrodden. And yes, we've had a lot of problems within our nation, but people are forgetting the wonderful things that God provided for America. And now we're all supposed to be one in the world because we're supposed to be like everybody else. But God didn't make America to be like everybody else. Amen. God made America to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And until we get back to doing that, in the church and being different and being unique in this world, we're not going to have the power that God has provided for us. Mm. And I believe that. And I think that there's a prevailing spirit that's coming about us. And it's always been there in one sense, but we've all made comments here in recent years how the years seem to be going by faster. Yeah, I understand when you get older, the years go by faster and so forth. I understand that. But folks, we are allowing the culture, we, we are allowing uh, the political pundits, we are allowing people to come in and tell us what we can and cannot preach, how we should and should not live, uh, how, how we should and should not think. Um, even the uh, 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 Attorney General of the state of New York about a month ago got up and said, America is not a place where you should have the right to have your own thoughts. You should do what we tell you. Mm. I thought, are you out of your mind? That's diametrically opposed to what the Constitution says right at the beginning. <laughs> you know, we're free. We have a right to think what we think. We have a right. No, we don't have a right to go out and just kill people. But we have a right to think how we think. We have a right to have our own thought process. We, we have a right to, to voice that. But that's all being taken away, and they're taking away the rights of Christians, they're taking away the rights of everybody else, and we are walking in a prevailing spirit, and we need to understand that, and understand how important it is for us to live for Christ, and, and to exalt Him every step of the way. It has been something uh, to behold. And you say, well, what is, what is going on? Why? As I said before, when the church becomes weak, sin in the public arena becomes strong, and sin becomes acceptable. So, well, sin has always been acceptable to the sinner. No, there, are, there, are, we're all, people are sinners, but there are some things that even the hardness of of sinners would not accept in past days: homosexuality in the open, lesbianism, uh, transgenderism, 
All these things are now, not only are they open, they're accepted and they're pushed by the government to make you have to accept it and to, and to make you have to agree with it. And I'm telling you, it's more than just a, a sinful standard. There's a demonic activity going on around here. Amen. And it's becoming more and more uh, uh, greater and greater as we're getting closer and closer to the time Jesus is coming back. Because I believe that this, this precursor, this 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 time before the Antichrist's arrival, first of all, the church won't be here. There will people tell you that they will be here. Well, you better read your scripture again. And, and you better do a little study because the only thing that's holding back the deluge to be so overwhelming in this world is you and I being here the salt. That's holding back a lot of the uh, stuff that's to come. But that's not going to last forever. And the church is not holding a whole lot back anymore because the most of them that call themselves, quote, clergy and call themselves Christian are denying the faith, are turning their back on the blood. They're, they're trampling the very body of Christ and, and they're walking around uh, with big crosses and little spiritual minds that don't mean a thing to anybody but just say, everything's okay, come in a nice ornate building, sit down there, sing the songs of the faith, and you can have your homosexual way and you can be your lesbian way and you can do all these things and God will just accept you. Let me tell you something, that's a lie from the pit. And we got to stop yes. it, and we need yes. to understand what's going on, and we need to stand strong, and we need to let the Lord know we love Him and we care about what He's done for us, and let the world know, even if they come in here and shoot every one of us, that we'll die all with our last breath saying, Jesus saved. Hey, Amen. And He's the only one who saved. And there's a standard by which He will come to us. And I got news for you. I believe, and you can take, and I know somebody's probably going to hear this, and we probably won't have a church next week to blow it up. The LGBTQ dimension of things, as it is today, folks, if you don't understand the, de the demonic activity that is fueling that, you don't understand Scripture. There's no way that they could get as far as they've gotten in the last 10 years or less without some supernatural help. I, I mean, God doesn't believe that. Uh, God can do anything, but you know what? We're supposed to be here as the guardians mm -hmm. of truth. Uh, there is no truth in this world. Everything is relative. And when everything is relative, there's no exact truth. You and I know that there's an exact truth. He, he declared himself truth when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. There is an exact truth. And his truth is what he says. And he says that all this other stuff is wrong. And that you should turn from it. And that you shouldn't have anything to do with it. Uh, yes, we must preach the gospel to every creature. And God's amazing grace can reach you deeper than your sinfulness can ever left to stay. And he can bring you up out of that nonsense. But I'm telling you, if the church doesn't get back to being the church, and if churches, even little ones like ours, uh, start losing faith and, and, and holding on, it's not holding on to the word. I mean, I'm telling you, we're going down a slippery slide pretty quick. Because there's nothing left. The, the, we're on a mudslide. And when the church won't stand up and declare this nonsense is wrong, then we're not, we're, not, we're not relaying the truth. Well, what do you mean? Our society, this world in general, but our society is living a perpetual lie. Mm. We're walking in perpetual untruth. I mean, even to the point, let me, and you've heard me say it, but I've got, I, I just can't help it. Uh, we've got to say it again, and maybe somebody will say it, and I don't know, people are going to rise up, I'm sure, if anybody ever comes across. But I'm telling you, when we walk in a perpetual lie and we allow it to continue in front of our faces, we're not only doing the world a disservice, we're slapping God right in the face. Yes. When we have people, and I've preached on this before, but when we have people in public office that can't even distinguish what they are and, and, and decide one day they're a man and the next day they're a woman, and, and we support that and, and we don't say anything about it, then we're perpetuating the law. Mm. 
Because we're here to preach the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. It's His way and the only way and the scriptural way. And the scriptural way declared that God created man and woman and the image of God created He them. And He didn't create Adam and Steve. He created Adam and Eve. Man. He created procreation. The, 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 the absurd thing that is going on in our country today is not, is not just the sinfulness that man has, but the rise of such demonic um, quarries such as people denying their gender. How can you deny your gender? How in the world can you deny what you are? Well, I just don't feel that way. I've got news for you. Your feelings ain't got nothing to do with it. Either you are a man or you're a woman. And I'm not going to call you a woman if you're a man. Right. I'm sorry. I'm not doing it. And they don't like me in the public office because I'll be politically wrong from the get-go. I'm not going to walk in there and some guy in some dress and I'm going to call him to her. Say, no, you're a man in, in the wrong get up, Bubba. Go get yourself straightened out and walk like you're supposed to and you'll feel better. Right. Good Lord have mercy. Why in the world could churches of the Lord Jesus Christ who have the privilege of holding the Word of God in their hand, deny the very fact of what God has done and agree with the nonsense that's going on. That's right. I don't understand that. I don't. I don't understand it. I know that there's great sin in the world and power, but you know, some things are just stupid for a man of God or a woman of God in our day, but anybody who claims to be a representative of Christ to walk down here and shake somebody's hand and agree with their sinfulness and degradation and pat them on the back over, shame on you! You're smacking the very uh, God who loved you right in the face. Hey, man. You can see I'm a little perturbed. Preach, brother. About it. That's right. Folks, it doesn't mean I don't love these people. I do. Because Jesus did. That's right. And I, I, I know they need help. I can remember a time when somebody come and say, you know, I'm having homosexual thought. They would immediately, and, and sometimes it, it was harsh. I have sanitary mom, but then they would try to get somebody help. Say, listen, we need to help you understand what's going on here before you do something that you're going to regret later. Yes. But now we just embrace it. And, and not only that, we not only embrace the homosexuality, we, we call them clergy and put them up in our pulpits. And then we declare how wonderful the love of Christ is because they can so freely do their work. They're not doing any work that's scriptural. No. And if it ain't scriptural, it's damnable. Mm. I got news for you. Study the book. So I don't like that kind of preaching. God loves everybody. God died for everybody. God hates sin. Mm. That's right. And God loves you enough to die for you, but He hates your sin. And it will be judged. And it will be judged here. Yes. Not only in the life to come. Because judgment begins in the house of God. And let me tell you something. If you put up a house and you put God's name on it, you better be living right. Because you're using His name for evil and unruly things. God's going to deal with that. Now there's your warning. Well, He hasn't so far. I guarantee He has. You, you just ain't felt it yet. It's coming. People denying their gender. People denying, listen. People calling themselves neutral. Now how can you call yourself neutral? You either have female parts or you have male parts. Now, just because you say it don't make it right. I can call myself a peach and don't make me a peach. I can go sit in a in in a garage that don't make me a car. You know the I mean it gets silly sometimes. Absolute nonsense. And the church supposedly the ones, the bearers of the oracles of God are agreeing with the nonsense because somebody's got a PhD from some ungodly, unholy seminary that doesn't know a thing about Christ and has very even less knowledge about Scripture. They're standing up declaring they have the ways of God when God already declared it. Yes. They're denying the power and the understanding thereof. And God forgive us for letting education and things creep in that, that, that is so wrong that we can still walk around under the guise of, man, I've got the knowledge, I've got this. Every church, listen, I'm all for education if it's from the right place. The best place is Holy Spirit University. That's where you can right. 
you all need to get a graduate degree from there. But how in the world can you call yourself neutral? I mean, that, that one girl came along. She's a Methodist deacon. Well, she's a pastor now, I think. Called herself in. Well, how in the world are you going to represent God when you're neutral? God's not neutral. God's very clear. That's right. <laughs> how can you call yourself neutral? How can this stuff be happening? How can we be asking? I read an article on this. I wish I'd have printed it out. Children as young as three and above are being asked what they think they want to be, male or female. Yes. You know, every little boy, when I was growing up, all of us, at one point or another, might have played with a doll or some kind of, I mean, you know, and quickly, Dad would come in and say, no, that's a girl's thing, son. He'd kind of direct you down the right path. Now, you can't do that. You can't whip your kids anymore, so now you can't even intellectually help them understand what they're supposed to be. Because the government knows better. No, the devil don't want you. They, if he can capture that mind early, then it'll be harder to get them to turn around later on when you try to tell them the truth. Mm. We have unqualified parents being unscriptural because they don't know God, they don't want to, they don't care about God. And I'm telling you, when God's left out, you get what the world gives. And you don't want what the world gives. In this country, there used to be at least a standard of life. It was a Judeo-Christian ethic. Whether you believe me or not, there was still a standard. That there was a certain line most people wouldn't cross, no matter how bad you were. Kids understood that they, if they did something wrong and they didn't get it right, they were probably going to get a whooping. Yes. Now, we were not allowed to do that anymore, no. but they got a whooping. Mm -hmm. My poor dad would have been in jail years ago if that was like it was when I was a kid. Because he didn't have any problem going out to get in that will of switch and help me to understand the correction and correct my error when I was when I was rebellious. Nobody said to beat anybody. But there are times when there has to be a rod of correction, and I think we've 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 put that way about they asking kids if they want to be male or female, how they feel about it. What's a three to six to ten year old know about feelings about anything? Most young boys, if, if they're honest and, and they've been raised in, in any modicum of a, of a home, of a natural progressive home, under, meaning husband, wife, and so on and so forth, when they get around 9, 10, 11, they're going to start looking at girls. But now we're redirect. That's okay. You don't have to look at girls. You can look at boys. And you can join the Boy Scouts and, and be led by a pedophile. You can join. And my goodness, where, what is going on? And where is the church? Well, they might sue us. Let them sue us. Man, we're going to stand for God one of these days. Yes. And I can just see it as years to come. If whatever ministry I'm in here, wherever, I can, I can almost see uh, some of these kids are going to start coming because they're going to be so confused they don't know where to turn. I thought I was a boy, and now I want to be a girl, and now I want to be a boy again. I mean, it, it's, it's not a zipper you can put on and off, folks. That's right. Where's the church? How can all this stuff be happening? Then there's the perversion of transgenderism. Now, you might not understand what I'm going to say here, but I want you to listen closely. The way that it is portrayed today, I believe transgenderism is another form, now listen, of evolution. They can't prove evolution. They've tried their best. It's always going to be a theory because there's no way you can ever prove it. And you and I don't need to prove it because the Bible says in the beginning of God. That's right. God, God, there was God who created Adam and Eve. They were smart. They, Adam didn't grab Eve and pull her through the weeds and take her into the hut or to, to the cave and write on cave thing. That's not, they were smart. Adam was given the task of naming all the animals. Folks, you got to have a brain to do that. That's right. And he didn't stand there writing on the wall going, well, this thing, I'm going to, now I, I think I'll call that a cow. He didn't do that. He was smart. He had the image in the mind of God. And he had the, he had the presence of God's uh, knowledge. Right. They didn't walk around pulling each other by the hair. I, I, I'd like to try that once. <laughs> That's all I get. Because if I had hair, it'd be smacking on me. You know, 
John, come on down here and pull your wife out of here and grab her. Yeah. See, see how long that's going to last. Yeah. It's nonsense. Tell our kids, these kids, people coming in here, and because they found some writings on the wall. Let me tell you something. 4,000 years ago, God put some writing on the wall. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Said your, your kingdom has is, is been divided. It's hanging in the balances. 2,000 years ago, here's some writing on the skyline. Yeah. The cross. Mm. But see, we're not seeing that. We're going back 14 billion years in absolute ridiculousness. Church, wake up! Amen. Start believing the Bible again. Start believing what God said again. Stop trying to prove something you don't have to prove. God's already said it. What else prove to you and I who walk by faith need? Amen. Well, because it sounds so we look so foolish. The Bible says that there's a way that seems right in the man, and the end of the earth is a way of destruction. And I'm telling you, you better you, you look foolish to the world. You don't want to look foolish to God. That's right. Either you believe His word or you don't. Oh, I'm struggling, so you shouldn't have to struggle. If you've been born again, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. He will give you understanding. That's right. James declared that. And he said, not only give it. The only time you hear me say the word liberal, but the Bible says he'll give it to you liberally. And he said, he'll give you all you need. My goodness. Transgender. It's another form. They, they just feel like if we can keep saying it enough, I, you know, I'll wear the nasty old, I mean, I'll, I'll wear a woman's dress and put on a woman's makeup. And there's some of these guys, I mean, they ugly. I'm sorry. I mean, I said, man, if you, if you really think you're a woman, go back to being a man, you'll get along better. Because that's nasty. And folks, it is ugly when you're trying to change right. what God says. It is ugly when you're trying to do what God has taken and reversed it. It is ugly. It's nasty. The world, the church has no business. The church has, is in the business of preaching the gospel and letting people know we love them, but we must stand up and say, what in the world is going on? Even the doctors nowadays are accepting, accepting it. When doctors, psychiatrists in the past would help try to get people out of that, now they're passing laws, especially in Canada, but there are some states that are passing laws that no therapist can, can perform any kind of of therapy on anyone who's transgender or homosexual, even if they come and ask. It's against the law. Well, that's one of those times where we got to be like Peter and say, you know what? We have to obey God rather than man. Because okay. their eternal destinies is, is suspended on what, what you and I do. Oh, they don't have to stop being homosexual to get saved, but I guarantee you if they truly get saved, they're going to stop being homosexual. That's right. Because the Holy Spirit's going to convict them. Holy Spirit's going to come in. That, that's why that we come to this. <coughs> that's why we proclaim the word. But now I'm telling you, we got to get back. I mean, if Jerry Fall was still alive, he re, I mean, you, you talk about him and DJ. I mean, these things were happening, but not they, they would never have believed what has happened since 2007, the last 10 or 11 years. They, they, would, just, they would just be unbelievable. If you say, I'm a female long enough, or if I'm a male long enough, and you begin to believe it, and you'll make everybody around you believe it, I'm not going to use for you folks. People really, really don't believe it. They just don't want to fight the battle. People aren't that stupid. But yet, we just suck it up and say everything's okay. We have taken the shame of sin out and called it an alternate lifestyle or an alternate belief. Attempting to change the laws of nature because we have changed the laws of reason. Everything's reasonable. Whatever you want to be, you can be, no matter how far fetched it is. I'm I'm walking around some idiotic, ridiculously mind-numbing brain says I'm an in. I don't want to be male nor female. Well, what do you want to be? And what's what's the method of it? Where's the end of this? I'm creating something new. No. I got news for you. God's already created. It's established right. in the heavens. That's and you're going to pay for trying to change what God yes, yes. has already done. So what's that got to do with the Antichrist? What I'm trying to get across is things don't happen on the spur of the moment. There, there's always, I mean, this stuff about abortion and stuff really started back in the 30s and 40s with the mindset 
Of course, people suppress that. But you, you go back, the, the, the evidence was there where people were starting to do things. Homosexuality, you know, it, it was behind closed doors, but there was a very active lifestyle. Churches would fight against it, but finally, I mean, we, we finally got to the point that we're, of course, in the 60s, the free love thing came out and all this other stuff, and then drugs involved and all that, of course. But this hadn't happened overnight. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like the little foxes. It gets in there, and they keep on uh, chewing away, and they keep on chewing away, and the church, the powerful church, Stop preaching the powerful word and stop talking about Jesus is coming again and stop talking. And we, we became a social gospel. <laughs> a whole man sadly said, if there was a social gospel back in the prodigal son's day, to somebody give him a sandwich, give him a bed, and he would never have gone home. And that's what we do today. We tell people, oh, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. God loves you anyway. And they never come back to the Father. Because we've just social them right into heaven. Mm. There's no conviction. And folks, we are living in a time where there's a Christless, convictionless Christianity. Mm. And that's not right. So I don't like that kind of preaching. Man, I, I had a woman come to me one time and, and her husband had, hadn't been in church and we were, we were trying to get him saved and said, all you guys do, man, he come, all he hears is that bloody stuff and Christ died for your sins and how terrible we are and all that. And I, and I said, well, you know, I'm not just preaching how terrible you are, I'm preaching how, how wonderful he is. Because how terrible you are makes his greatness even greater. Because mm. he died for you, you miserable sinner. <laughs> Well, I don't like hearing that. That hurts my heart. Well, it ought to hurt your heart. Jesus died for your heart, and you ought to humble yourself before Him. Mm. Well, I know sometimes we can be over exuberant. I understand that, but let me tell you something. You're, you're dying and going to hell. What, what would you like for me to do for you? Amen. Tell you it's going to be, it's going to be okay. Pet, kind of like I pet that stupid cat out there. I'm going to love that little moron. <laughs> But he, but he keeps he keeps bringing me trophies. <laughs> oh yeah, and they're nice though. Praise the Lord. A couple of birds. I walked out one time. There were feathers everywhere. I said, "Boy, there must have been a scrap out here." Like, <laughs> I mean, he tore one up somewhere. There were feathers everywhere. I said, "Cat, what are you into? <laughs> Don't you get yourself diseased or something?" I would not hesitate to get rid of that problem. But you know. Folks, we're, we're living in a city. Yeah, now, I've, 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 I've made comments about the cat. Now, I mean, I love animals. I really do. I'm not a big cat person, but that cat seems to love me. He'll go anywhere I go. And he, he won't come in. I can't leave him in the house. We, we did for a while. We, the dander stuff just killed me. And, uh, but he's out there. But now when Justin comes home at night, Justin says he swing, he just gets through his legs. Right, right. When, when Justin's there, come on in. Well, Daddy, you got through my legs. Yeah. yeah. But you know, isn't that what we do sometimes? Something gets our attention, and all of a sudden we just let it in. So when we need to be careful. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I don't mind petting that cat. It's going to be outside. You know, because I know what it can do to me. Uh, and, and it really did. I'm not being funny. I, was, I really got sick a couple of weeks there until my head just burst. And then I realized it had to be that cat. And when you put it back outside, it kind of relieved itself. And, and uh, I don't have those headaches like I did. And I'm sad for that because I really do care for the kitty. But my, my point is, we have to be careful, folks. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful what, what we let in. Mm -hmm. As innocent as it may seem, it's going to carry some disease, something that's going to hurt you if you're not careful. Everything is reasonable. It's reasonable for a man to use a woman's bathroom and vice versa. Did you read this week where the target in Chicago, a man, a man that day said he's a woman, big old burly, nasty looking, ugly guy walked in there and exposed himself to a nine-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody's going to do anything about it. Folks, you go to Target, don't go to Target. We haven't gone to Target in two years, and I ain't going back to Target. I won't go in there. I'll, 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 I'll crawl somewhere else before I go and target if it's five feet away from me. I won't, I won't shop there. The, the guy that runs that store is a heathen. I am telling you. It's sad. 
Even Franklin Graham came out and said, listen, we got to boycott this month. I mean, they, they are so nasty. They, they just open up. And you can go, and nobody's going to say anything to you. When a girl gets raped in there? Or a boy, for that matter. Or some woman. I mean, let me tell you, women, I, I'm sorry, but some women are just as bad as some guys. Predators. You just swear. And, you, and you're telling me God's not taking note of all this? When mankind didn't even have the decency to separate the sexes, even when they're using uh, their bodily functions? That's just absolute nonsense. That is so far beyond understanding how anyone would allow that to happen. <coughs> There's a way that seems right. It's, un it's reasonable to dress as a woman and read to small children. Did you see that? Well, this guy dressed up as a, he's, he's a transgender. <laughs> and when I first saw the picture, I thought it was Bozo the Clown. I really did. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be blamed. That guy was nasty. He brought him into a kindergarten class, and he was reading to the kids. My kid would not have been there three seconds. The parents are afraid to do or say anything now, and they're letting these people come in there to show them that they're just people. Folks, they aren't just people. They're, they have a mental illness that needs to be addressed. It does. Who are you to judge? I don't have to judge. When a big burly guy puts on makeup and sits down in a dress that, that, I mean, come on. Come on. Nonsense. When are we going to get back? When it's reasonable for children to make decisions about, listen now, this is the next step. If you come up to kids that are six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and ask them how they are, how they feel about their about their gender identity, what's the next step in that? Well, then they can control their own sexual passion. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Let, let some guy deal with you, or let some woman uh, 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 deal with a young girl in the nasty way, or vice versa. There's been a thing out for years where men have, have been trying uh, um, legally to be able to say it's okay to have sex with children around nine, eight or nine and above, and some younger. And where's the church at? Where's the preachers in the pulpit? We're supposed to preach the love of Christ. I'm telling you, you rotten heathen, God loves you enough to die for you, and you should accept that because you need it. I'm getting sick and tired of, of cowtowing to these people who are committing heinous crimes against our children and we're allowing it to go on. And now we take them to a, a major a, a store chain and my kid, can I keep worrying about my kid going to the bathroom? Because of what might be in there trying to, to, trying to assault him or her. It, it's a shame you know, that you got to walk in there. I mean, with, with Justin Small, that's one thing as a man. But if his mom was with him, it, it'd be a shame. But I guarantee him she'll be going right there with him. Now, I'm not letting you go by yourself. Or he'd she, she'd take him to the woman's side and protect him while he has to do his thing. So, well, that's, you're, you're really preaching something. And the folks, it is not, let me tell you, what I'm telling you is truth. And we're dealing with this today. And it's just going to get worse. It's reasonable that these kids are going to be taken to the next step so they can start making their own decisions about their own sexual desires instead of having guidance. Can you imagine how messed up these kids are going to be and, uh, if they're 9, 10, or 11 when they're about 20 and 21, 22? They're the ones with the guns. They're the ones who are going to go back to the people that put them in this situation. Let me tell you something. As, as, <coughs> as angry as everybody's been over the Sandusky mess, which was horrible, it's going to become the norm. You wait and see. It's going to become the norm. Well, you know, he, he just, he was just, uh, oh, oh, he was just helping that young man find his own sexual preference and all that. I, I can hear it coming. Can you, can't you? And the preachers like me and John and others who stand up and preach the word uh, with, with, with a little bit of conviction, it's going to be like, you're hate mongers. You hate it. I don't hate you. I love you enough to tell you that Jesus died for you right. and that if you don't get saved, hell's your home. Now listen, you don't have to be a Sandusky to go to hell. You just reject Christ. But I'm telling you, in this life to come, in this life, there's judgments going to come. Yes. 
And it's even going to be worse, I believe, for you when you've done to those children what these men and people have been accused and some people have been Amen. Um, convicted of. And the church is strangely silent anymore. Strangely silent. So my point is this. If we can, if in the, and it's, it's been, I know it's been several years, but especially in the last 10 or 12, such an overturn of public display of nasty affection. Even, I mean, um, walking down the mall, a husband and wife, or even a young couple holding hands, that's one thing. But girls um, in the malls and stuff, kissing, just getting a rise, they try, trying to show you that they can do it. Guys walking around kissing one another, makes me so sick, I can't hardly stand it. I want to throw up. Yes. And maybe I'll just go over there and throw up. That's what we should do. I love these people. I do. Because Jesus loved them. But that standard of nastiness, some parent, somebody has dropped the ball. And it's, it's probably some family that's been going on for decades has dropped the ball. And the churches for decades have dropped the ball. We, there's no moral standard, no moral compass anymore. And I'm telling you, um, uh, there's not anybody on the national scene. There's a few good pastors out there, but no, there's nobody on the national scene that will stand up and point the finger and say, this is nonsense. This is wrong. Because they're afraid they'll be killed or ostracized. Oh, there's some good pastors out there. There's some good pastors in the church. But let me tell you something. God's going to raise up somebody. And then you know what's going to happen. We're going to have a war. But that's coming anyway. My point is, we wonder how, the, how in the world can Antichrist have the power he's going to have. First of all, the world's going to be in a different thing. The, the church is going to be gone. But even in our own time, folks, we're seeing where that prevailing spirit has so corrupted the minds of people. That they're, they're taking what is right. They're, the Bible says woe unto them that say wrong is right and right is wrong. And that's exactly what we've done. We've taken the absolute wrong and made it the absolute right and, and the political correct route. And we're telling that the, 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 the moral standard that we've been raised on, the Judeo-Christian ethic, is wrong. And it's got to be put aside because it holds people back from their true feelings. It holds people back from their ultimate sinfulness. That was good. But now people can go and be what they want. And they can do it in front of you and in front of your kids. And nobody says a word because they're afraid. Antichrist ain't here yet. I believe he's in the, I, I believe he's in the world somewhere. I do. I think he's, and I think, there's, I think if you don't understand that the stage is being set, you don't understand how close you are to being redeemed and being raptured. Because I believe we're just about there. Our preacher's been saying that for years. Even Peter said that. Yeah, but Peter didn't live through what we've lived through. That's right. Peter hasn't seen what we've seen in this day and time where the world... Now, understand me. The, the, the Roman Empire, got, especially the Caligula and others, were just absolutely debauched. They did things you and I, even today, would be embarrassed to even think about. There's no doubt about that. It was a debauched um, society, and that's why they're no longer around, by the way. You know? Rome is, but not like that. It fell from grace. It, it fell from its great power because they forgot about the God who, especially the church, quite frankly, in Rome. They knew everything but what the Scripture says in there. Mm. Don't they? It, it's all sinless. Jesus preached to the, to the multitude from a boat. He never walked in anywhere. And please, if you're listening, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited, but we, we worry about the smells and bells and all this stuff that's supposed to bring us to worship. Jesus preached from a boat the words of life. Mm. If you've got to have all that to get in the mood to worship, I think, I think you're missing the point completely. You know? It may not hurt us if we took these pews out and put boxes in here that we have, we're a little uncomfortable and might give us to keep our attention where we're supposed to have it. You know? When I was going to Delta growing up, we had pews that looked just like these, except they knew they weren't padded. 
And boy, when it got hot in the summer, we had no AC in that day. There was no AC in there. There was some heat. In the but we had to, you know, we, we had to raise the windows. And when it was about 90 degrees outside, the little fans, little funeral fans, going, your, your leg stuff got stuck to them pews. And, oh, yeah, it was, it was a real, um, you know, difficulty going through. Man, if, that, if that's as bad as we had it, if that's all we had, we had it pretty good compared to people in other parts of the world that are dying of hunger, dying of pain, uh, dying, but they don't have the privilege of getting all scuffed up and going into an ornate building and hearing and seeing all those wonderful things that's supposed to make up worship. Let me tell you something. Um, you humble yourself before a living God, you can worship Him in you Amen. Because He'll come to where you are. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Say, preacher, you got a little... One well, hallelujah message. Well, it depends on your way, the way you look at it, I guess. Yes. But I'm telling you today, I, I'm telling you today, as Pastor, oh my goodness, I preached on my phone. See, he didn't even have a good I have been so burdened over our community and things. And then, yeah, it's been a long time that we've been here. There's been. Things happen, comes and goes, and all those things that happen. <coughs> but folks, we need to understand God's still God. And we're here for a reason. We're here. For those of us who are in this place, the 11 or 12 of us that are here today, we're here for a reason. And I believe God's going to fulfill that. I really do. I think, I, I think that, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of things... I, I do believe, and as your pastor, as the pastor behind this pulpit, I'll, I'll confess, there's a lot of times I'll let prevailing spirits kind of woo me away from, or, or make, make me think, oh no, we can't do this or we can't do that. Let me tell you something. God's already conquered that. And for the rest of the life of this church, if I'm involved, I want it to be a place where people can hear the gospel and they'll, they'll hear it right, they'll hear it in love, they'll, they'll hear it straight, and they'll hear it because uh, we know that it's the truth and we won't back down from it no matter what else happens. And that God will be magnified in what we do here. Amen. And I believe, I truly believe, when I was thinking about this, thinking about all that we've gone through, there are many prevailing spirits from every now and then that just, like in most any church, but there's a time when you've got to just stand up and say, that's enough. Yes. That's enough. Christ will be magnified, and if you don't want to magnify the Lord, go somewhere else. Mm. I hope nobody here going to go anywhere else. But you know what? God's got it covered. He does. And I'm telling you, I wish every service could be one of them uplifting, walk in the pew, praise the Lord. And, that, and that's, that's fun, and that's necessary sometimes. But there's other times we just got to stop and take, wait a minute. How am I portraying? How am I portraying Christ when I'm out there? Um, am I just letting the status quo go by without saying anything? Stop telling me about you're a Baptist so much as to tell them that you're saved, born again by the Spirit of the Living God. Amen. Let them hear that out of your mouth first. But well, what are you? Well, I'm born again. How about you? Amen. What denominator? I'm redeemed. How about you? Amen. I believe the Bible cover to cover. How about you? Amen. I believe that Jesus died for my sin and rose again. How about you? Amen. I believe that the blood of Christ covered me and covered me from all my sin forever. How about you? Amen. I'm tired of backing up. We don't have to back up. Amen. We, got, we, we have the power of the God of the universe. Why are we moving forward? Well... Preachers can be blamed, and sometimes it's, it's right. We, we fail. Deacons can be blamed, sometimes that's right, because they fail. We can make decisions, like letting churches govern the church instead of letting pastors and, and godly deacons and people give you instruction that you need. We, we fail. We become more socially inclined than we do spiritually inclined. Say, well, what, what's wrong? Like when Grant has what's wrong with giving somebody a sandwich and giving them a bed? Nothing, but you can't leave them there. I mean, yeah, anybody coming here, and I, I'm sure any of us, if somebody was really in need, we'd make sure they had something to eat and some shoes on their feet or whatever. Any of us individually, certainly as a church, but I'm telling you, it can't stop there. Mm. 
So here, here's your food and here's your bed for the night. But let's, let's talk about your problem. Why are you out here rooting in the pig pen when you have a beautiful home that you can live in? Why are you out here re e eating the husk that even the pigs won't eat? So does that really happen? When people get caught up in some of the nastiness of this world, and it's easy to do, we can go through the pornography and the homosexual, all that. These people are eating the husks that even the animals would eat. We need, to give, we need to get them out of that, help them to understand, but we need to point them back how to get back home. And folks, in our case, the way of the cross leads home. We've got to understand that the prevailing spirits, and it's demonic in this world, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Are we, ever, are we going to overcome all that? No. There's things that's going to have to happen. But in our time, in our belly wake, in our little area of where we live, we're, we're to be a light that shines for the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what else comes down. Let the government come in and tell you you can't do it. You've got to do it anyway. Because there are times when Acts tells us that we have to obey God rather than man. And I'm going to tell you, I'm your pal, you may get on TV one of these days and see, well, that bald-headed dummy's in jail. But I'm telling you, if somebody comes to me and says, you have to call him, her, I ain't doing it. That's right. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to love him enough to tell him the truth. Listen, pal, I'll get you help. I'll even go out and buy you a pair of pants. Get you back dressed like you're supposed to be. Paul warned the Corinthians when they were having communion that they were to dress in the right apparel. That means when you study that Greek, it means that they're supposed to dress in accordance with what they are. Mm. Male or female. There wasn't supposed to be any guessing as to who's what. Why? Because you're made in the image of God and God made you what He wants you to be, a male or a female. Mm. Well, how in the world can we... <laughs> Come on. All right. This morning as we move forward, not only in our individual lives, but as a church and whatever, folks, let's get a real desire. First of all, for God to bring revival to us individually to our church, to bring revival in our area that we can be a catalyst used to bring. See, man, preaching like that, ain't nobody going to come. Let me tell you something. Preaching like that's the truth. God will bless the truth. Right. That <clears throat> pray not only that people just, I, mean, I don't only want to bring people out of homosexuality and lesbianism and all, all that's important, but if we'll preach the truth and get them saved, then we can teach them the Word. And the Holy Spirit will bring that nonsense to a close. But we have to be willing, we have to be willing to live a life before them. That shows the difference of how we preach and what we say. That it's true because we live it. We know it's true. That the redeeming power of Christ can change lives, as the old time preacher said, from the guttermost to the uttermost. Hmm. No matter how far you've gone. If you're listening, no matter where you're at, I know the heartstrings can be tugged by the Holy Spirit no matter what you think you are. And you can declare yourself one thing and be something else forever but in your own mind, but you know deep down you know the truth. Because that's an eight and never been. I really believe that. You know what you are. You're just denying. Because you want to make a statement, but really it's just your father and the devil has control over you, and he, he's going to make your life miserable even though you think you're having a good time. Because you're confused, you don't know where to turn, let me tell you, if you really want to, want to understand, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he will direct your path. Father, I pray now as, as we have this conversation, whether here or somebody might be listening, I pray that in Jesus' name, we, we, we would understand what's going on in our world and that it would make us live for Jesus even more. That that prevailing spirit of demonic activity can only be overcome by that wonderful Spirit, a Holy Spirit of God that dwells in all of us. And help us as they are so angry with us that as we walk in your, anywhere we go, as your representative, that we'll walk in and the power of God will be felt like it used to be felt when God's people would come around. 
Help us to not, help us to get rid of the things of the world and cling on to the things that are holy and righteous and good. Forgive us of our failure. And Lord, help us, I pray.